Hello and welcome back. Hope you had a nice lunch break. We're approaching the final straight here at the Big Things Conference. This afternoon is our final block. Now, to build a machine learning model, the quality and quantity of data are important. Of course they are. But our next speaker believes that there is another often overlooked type of data, metadata. To explain more, we have with us Jörg Schad, CTO of Arango DB. Jörg, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much for the introduction. Great to see you. <laughs> Thank you so much for organizing all of this. And yes, we'll dive into many different ways in which graph or data in general can be useful for your machine learning pipeline. Whenever you're ready, Jörg, take it away. I'm happy to take it off. And let's get started. Yeah, as mentioned, um, we will talk today about uh, different ways in which uh, machine learning um, can actually depend on different kinds of data. And so in short, uh, different ways graph data is important for your machine learning pipeline. What is ML metadata or metadata in general? And why is it so important? Why should you actually care if you want to build a production grade machine learning pipeline? And we'll briefly touch up on different open source solutions to solve that problem as well. Interestingly, when I looked at the schedule, the other talk which is happening right now is about uh, improving predictions by automatic drift detection. And that actually touches up on a similar or related field is like uh, when your data changes and we'll see how that relates to metadata as well. So uh, about me, I'm, uh, as already mentioned, CDO over at RangoDB. Basically, my entire career has been building uh, large-scale systems, either database systems or large-scale machine learning platforms. And that's why I'm very happy that in my current role, I can combine both of you from an ML operations perspective, but also from a database perspective and combine all those passions within one role. And uh, yeah, let's see how this combination looks like. So I think still for many people I, I interact with the typical view of someone writing machine learning code or a data scientist is like, we're sitting in front of your laptop, we have TensorFlow installed, everything's great, and we can really achieve really cool stuff. So we are kind of like the superhero. Uh, we have nowadays lots of data is available. We have huge compute centers, a lot of compute resources, and we also have really cool uh, machine learning models or machine learning research, which enables us to do really cool things. But the question is, how can we actually move from like um, and prototype over to something which actually involves our business, which moves us forwards, which generates value out of there? And that's actually, um, a bit less uh, exciting than we, we might imagine. I think for a lot of people, this uh, image of the data scientist and they get some data uh, from business, they write really intelligent machine learning codes, they train a model that performs great. So they run that model and then uh, they start over with the next uh, problem. Unfortunately, in reality, it looks a little different. So this is a chart from a Google paper, probably many of you have seen that, about the hidden depth in machine learning systems or machine learning pipelines. And as we can see here, so they try to quantify like where is their machine learning teams are spending their resources, their time on. And only this little black box here in the middle is the actual machine learning code. And basically everything around is from like data collection, data verification, resource management, et cetera, is actually way more cost intensive in terms of time compared to the actual ML code. So how, how does it then typically look like? So in reality, most machine learning pipelines I've seen across different companies follow roughly a similar scheme as this one here. So on the very left, we have some data and that can also be some streaming uh, stream data, uh, data stream. Uh, then our data engineers, our data scientists will go in and engineer some features. So uh, try to prepare the data, um, try to get rid of uh, missing data, try to form meaningful uh, features out of that. Next is then we would define our model and then train our model out of that. So this is usually very compute intensive. Also often we have multiple iterations here. And then we have either one or often also multiple models out. There. So multiple candidates uh, for model serving. 
And these need these models need to be managed, stored, and yeah, also we need to have a catalog to decide like which of those models do we then want to really deploy onto our live production system. And this is then where machine learning serving comes in. This is where we actually get value out of it. Imagine we have a web service distinguishing cats and dogs. This would be when we can deploy our machine learning models. Some user can upload an image and we try to predict whether it's a cat or dog or anything out there. So uh, next, uh, this is actually in, if you look at different open source systems, so for example, TensorFlow Extended, which is the uh, ecosystem around uh, the well-known TensorFlow framework, we actually follow a very similar model here. So on the left, we have the data ingestion, then we have data validation, the actual transformation, so uh, going into feature engineering, then our training, our model management, and then the pusher and uh, model serving. So uh, this is how it comes down to if you look at uh, some other some actual real world systems out there if you look at kubeflow or other systems they typically follow this very similar pattern uh, we've seen earlier what has that to do uh, with databases so as mentioned i work at RangoDB. this is a graph and beyond database so at the core we are really scalable graph database and we also can do uh, full text search we can do document etc um, which is not really the core here uh, of this talk, but why is that actually interesting to me uh, working at a database company? So what we see more and more happening to really build enterprise grade uh, machine learning systems, machine learning pipelines, database systems will play a pretty big role in that. A lot of the things we have invented or need for database systems like role management, permission management, tracking of different resources, can actually also help us to move from like a prototype machine learning solution uh, our research team built to something which we can actually utilize in our enterprise. This is a paper by Microsoft, really interesting read, uh, but uh, we'll see also some aspects of that in the coming slides. So um, if we go through this pipeline, let's just have a look for where databases can actually play a role. I think the obvious uh, part of uh, the schema uh, of this pipeline where databases play in is on the data in streaming side, obviously. So uh, we could either load data from a database uh, or store data in a database, but that can be the source uh, of uh, our um, training, training data and uh, verification data. Next part where it can also play in is in the feature engineering and model training. Interestingly, especially graph databases are often used for analytics. And uh, there we can already have uh, some unsupervised machine learning models like k-nearest neighbors, uh, like community detection or other things where in that sense, we don't really train a model, but we can extract, for example, features uh, which can then be leveraged for our model training. So basically, we often see databases and also in particular graph databases being used in this preparation of data. Now, most interestingly, uh, this is also where we see a lot of the future of uh, machine learning is basically by explicitly leveraging uh, graph machine learning. If we look at, for example, what DeepMind is doing in terms of uh, Google Maps ETA predictions, if we look at what computational chemistry is doing in terms of drug discovery uh, molecules, if we look at them, they're actually also a graph. Uh, a lot of the new research, also if you look at NeurIPS and other big conferences, are actually uh, revolving around graph machine learning, around graph analytics. And I really like this quote here. We can really make better predictions if we utilize relationships explicitly. The example I, I typically give here is, imagine here in the middle, we have some social network and uh, we want to predict churn in our network. In traditional machine learning, we would go in and basically for each user, we would have a feature vector out there and then try to predict its churn probability. In Imagine now actually all our friends have just left uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever favorite network we are talking about. And uh, we now want to predict the probability that I here in the middle uh, will churn as well. 
obviously this will be pretty high because now all my close friends have just left the network and probably I'll have a similar reason as them for leaving as well. So this is kind of key to this uh, idea of graph machine learning that we can explicitly leverage those neighborhood or connection information out there. Um, so kind of what, uh, what are the different stages there? We can have simple graph queries. So for example, imagine you're a LinkedIn and you want to show a user like, hey, who could give you an introduction to another user? So basically who is on that path between you and the other user? That's a simple graph query, basically any graph database systems can, can deal with. Furthermore, we can have graph analytics. Who is the most connected person? Who are the influencers I, I need to target? Uh, who are the kind of recommender systems are also often built on top of graph analytics. And then we have the graph machine learning, which can actually help us to build statistical machine learning model and then do uh, predictions such as, for example, who are potential connections? So what edges are missing in our graph? Who is likely to churn, um, as we just discovered in the example of uh, predicting churn in, in a social network or any other kind of network? And those are the different things uh, we, we can actually deal with uh, from, from a graph analytics, from a graph ML perspective. Um, I think the interesting insight here is that uh, often traditional machine learning has the assumption that individual records are independent and identically distributed data. In reality, this is often not the case. So in real world data scenarios, in real world graphs, we often have assumptions, for example, as homophily, that neighboring nodes are similar. As I said, if all my friends have just left a particular network, probably I my likelihood to churn is also higher uh, than some random person in that network. And this is actually what we see a lot happening right now that people go in and explicitly exploit uh, the graph structure in terms of uh, network. Most interestingly, and as this is what most of this talk will actually be about is that databases can play a role for the entirety of your graph ML pipeline. What do I mean by that? Let's actually uh, take, take a look at an example. So I used to work in, an, um, in, in a healthcare scenario, healthcare AI startup, and we had that challenge uh, that we were training uh, models based on some, uh, on some privacy relevant data. And now the question ca came up, what actually happens if one of those people is withdrawing his consent for us to use his data? It's kind of a bit still under debate, whether under CCPA or, uh, those privacy laws, uh, we would have to withdraw our model because the model is actually influenced by this sensitive data on the other hand, but at least we wanted to be able to identify which models here on the other end were actually impacted by that data. So we went through our entire pipeline. So we looked at the data side, identified the data files which had uh, those patient records in there. We uh, went next, like which features did we generate out of those data sets? Manual step, looking through logs, very lengthy. Then we looked on uh, what models did we train with that data? Again, very lengthy, looking through logs, very annoying to check. What models resulted out of that? What models were in our training, uh, in, in our model management software? And then last step, what are, which of those models did we actually deploy to production? So this was actually a manual lookup across all those different pipeline stages, which was very annoying uh, to uh, and very time consuming to figure out. And this was basically the point where we were like, oh, we need a solution here, uh, which helps us to identify that automatically. If you're more interested in like what kind of information can be pushed through an, a machine learning pipeline, there's an interesting uh, paper, the secret sharer. So uh, unintended memorization in neural networks, which is pretty much about like how much your training data can be can influence uh, or can be retrieved uh, by the uh, models later on. So basically, can, can I actually guess a credit card number which was used during training in the live model later on? So really interesting read. And again, kind of relating to like, how does our initial data impact uh, the model in the end? Uh, when going through there, we identified a number of other challenges we would like to solve as well. So as mentioned, a biggest problem for us was we wanted to understand <clears throat> the provenance of a model. Where was it trained from? Which features did it come from? And uh, understanding that also gave us, should give us a complete uh, version history. 
and also an audit block. If you're working in constrained environments, often those audit logs are really important, like who trained what, who was all involved in uh, training a certain model, uh, which different parties. Um, then also comparing uh, the performance across different models, if they really uh, were uh, evolved over time, finding reusable steps for what can be reused uh, different features. I think that notion of feature stores uh, or feature catalogs is becoming more popular as well. Um, this is something we looked at as well. And then also the question is my serving data. So is this uh, data I actually see, the data distribution on my serving side, is it actually the same than what I've seen on my training side? And by the way, this is what the uh, parallel talk is right now about. Um, and we basically said like, oh, this is currently pretty hard to answer. What do we need? We need metadata. What is metadata about? So here is a definition from uh, Kubeflow. Um, so Kubeflow is basically a way to deploy a variety of different machine learning uh, to deploy machine learning pipelines on top of Kubernetes, uh, in short. And uh, here is the definition is basically uh, metadata is information about runs, executions, uh, basically anything but the data itself. So uh, we can basically see it. Uh, we know when a certain, we have meta information about a certain data set. When was it created? When was it accessed? How big it is, et cetera, who has access? We have information about transformations from which data set was it derived, when was it transformed, when was it trained, if we talk about models. So this is basically all metadata uh, for us. And next, we were actually looking at uh, collecting the metadata across the entire pipeline. So we wanted uh, metadata across all those different steps to be stored in a single database store. As mentioned, when we went through that exercise, it basically was a manual merges. We somewhere had that meta data about our data sets, somewhere else about our features, somewhere else about our models. But uh, the realization was actually, hey, we need that in one single database. And this is uh, when we actually started uh, to develop an open source solution called Orango ML pipeline, where we used Orango DB as, as a common uh, store for that. So it's a simple Python interface on top, uh, where which plugs into different machine learning systems and easily allows us to store this uh, metadata. Uh, main goal when developing that was to, A, to keep it open source so anyone can contribute and extend it, uh, but then also really to make it extensible because already in our environment, we had different uh, training jobs. We had some Spark jobs, we had some TensorFlow jobs, some PyTorch jobs, et cetera, and all of them were creating different metadata. And uh, this actually also led to our choice of using OrangoDB down here uh, because we first evaluated relational database systems. There we really faced the challenge of, oh, we would have to put that in a fixed schema. Next, uh, we evaluated um, document databases and there it was really hard to, tr uh, to track the lineage in between. And this is where we ended up at OranguDB, which both supports a graph model, but also that document model. So on an individual level, uh, we were able to store uh, in, in a flexible schema, different information. So for example, the description of a data set is just a JSON format. There are no fixed fields. We had a general schema for it, but it could really vary whether data was coming from HDFS or where, whether data was coming from, for example, S3 or some other data source. Similar for the transformation, similar for the features, um, they all, the information we actually stored heavily depended on which system we were using in the end. Um, then um, the next step we needed is we needed to connect that information. And this is really where the graph part is coming in. So uh, by having a graph database in general, we can go in and then connect those different uh, pieces of information. So we can say like, hey, this data set, is related to this transformation. This transformation is related to this feature, this feature again, and, and so on and so on. And keep in mind, there might also be branches or even loops in that. One feature might be derived from, from another feature out there. Um, and so with this uh, kind of information, uh, that question, which data set is impacting what kind of models just turns into a graph reachability query because you're basically asking what models can I arrive from, from a certain data set in this graph? 
And this actually, I think is a kind of very nice insight that we can query all of that from a graph perspective, uh, because in the end, this, this forms a graph of how different uh, components are depending on each other, what the provenance of certain artifacts is within our pipeline. And uh, yeah, here, for example, this, this would be just a simple query to just look up all the entities uh, being derived from, from a certain feature. And uh, you can also uh, be ended up having really simple queries uh, in, for all the different challenges mentioned above from uh, finding out the provenance, from finding out uh, then the audit log, like who, uh, who all contributed to training a certain model, which Again, if you work in restricted environments such as finance, healthcare, so this can be pretty important questions to ask. Um, and yeah, with that, it actually uh, turned out to be a really useful tool for different kinds of people. Initially, it was mostly driven from like a data ops perspective. They wanted to track that lineage. They wanted to make sure we are compliant with GDPR, CCPA um, uh, regular, like regulations. But in the end, uh, with that, we could also, the data ops person uh, can also use it for the audit trails for reproducible model building. So like if we want to go in and retrain a certain model, we can really identify what is all the, what are all the different artifacts which went in there? What were the random seeds uh, used for a particular training run? and those kind of things, because it's all stored in the associated metadata and enabled us to really retrain a model with a single click. Similarly, the, the data scientists themselves, they also get really interested in that uh, because it, made it, it makes it very easy to look up relevant entities for a given model. Imagine you're at a large company, you have a model predicting uh, let's take again user churn and you want to build a, a similar model um, and if you can now go in and really understand the pipeline which was used for the previous model this will make your job a whole lot easier especially if you're new to the team and you don't have the history so uh, onboarding new data scientists really became much easier for us uh, similarly, it's also it's very nice to track performance differences. So as we uh, can serve multiple models in parallel, we can then compare where's actually the difference. Why do they behave different in terms of runtime or in terms of uh, precision as well? And uh, I think overall, it makes it much easier to reuse certain entities across your pipeline if you have a catalog of that. I've seen way too many companies uh, who just build such a uh, kind of pipeline, they train a model, and then this model is just used as, as an entity by itself. I, I would hope that kind of one of the takeaway messages from this talk is that you shouldn't treat a model uh, just as a singular entity, but treating a model with its history makes it actually valuable in production grade scenarios. Um, then last but not least, also like our administrators, uh, tracking the usage or, or SREs nowadays, uh, uh, tracking the resource usage, usage uh, became uh, much easier because they could just see like who ran how many jobs on our uh, training various training platforms, um, who um, used those models in the end, and uh, this actually helped us to do uh, resource accounting across those uh, different across different teams across different models in the end. So um, maybe just uh, going a little bit into details on uh, how a Rango ML treats that uh, by itself. I mentioned in the beginning, uh, it's an open source project designed um, to be extensible. So this is why I put schema in, um, in quotations here, but uh, we try to come up uh, with a with a connection, with a graph, uh, so to say, of uh, useful entities uh, for most people. Uh, so we, for example, have uh, an entity for a preset entity for data sets. We have preset entity for transformation features, experiments uh, with different performance uh, characteristics for model later on, then uh, for serving performance. So this is all kind of like very easy and it's in the pre-existing API. Again, the advantage of graph here is that we are flexible. So uh, most, actually any system I saw uh, wasn't like uh, any other system. So I feel they really vary in uh, what they do. 
uh, and also how they combine certain things, uh, real world uh, pipelines, despite following this general scheme. Uh, but this is, as you have a graph, you can dynamically change it, uh, change the edges in between. So you can add new entities, you can change the edges in between uh, what they derive from, and basically set your graph schema for your specific uh, ML pipeline. Uh, in the end, it's it's a Python package, uh, has an HTTP API, uh, which uh, most people use that allows you to plug into any existing system out there. We also have a TensorFlow extended integration. And uh, then from that within your machine learning code, from within your machine learning system, you can basically just register different entities and uh, basically then also register the provenance in, in between. Uh, you can, there comes with a handy UI, you can discover certain entity, uh, entities, you can search your metadata. For example, you want to build a new model for user predictions, you might want to search uh, models uh, which are doing something similar and uh, which are being used in production. And then in the end, of course, there's also a graph view where you can view the graph of, uh, of your entire uh, metadata. So uh, we, this is not the only open source solution out there. Uh, there are also others. Uh, unfortunately, they weren't available when we uh, developed it. Otherwise, we probably would uh, might have co-developed on this as well. But for example, also TensorFlow Extended, so TFX in short, um, also came up with its own uh, metadata solution out there called uh, Machine Learning uh, Metadata, uh, MLMD. And uh, this actually plugs into the existing uh, TensorFlow extended system and each component in TensorFlow uh, will automatically, if you enable it, write its metadata into that store. Interestingly, if you, if you look at it, um, the uh, metadata store is, uh, is following a graph pattern. And this is something where uh, we also reached out to the TensorFlow extended team uh, to come up with a more extensible interface to actually support a graph interface, because uh, in the beginning, uh, they actually just used to write it uh, back to a relational database, which felt like, hey, you're uh, turning everything into a graph, then you uh, transform it into a relational model, then you retrieve it again for querying it. And uh, I think this is just, uh, again, an interesting revelation uh, that this metadata is actually forming a graph and uh, is also becoming uh, more and more important as uh, TensorFlow Extended implemented it. Kubeflow is now also supporting um, metadata tracking and most of the big machine learning uh, systems, uh, open source uh, systems I see out there are supporting uh, some kind of metadata storage. And as mentioned, if you're building your own platform, um, a Rango ML uh, pipeline can be the solution for you because it's just an HTTP API you can leverage with Spark, with TensorFlow, with PyTorch, and uh, your favorite solution and your favorite custom stack. So you don't need a, a pre-built um, machine learning pipeline uh, supporting it out of the box, even though I must say, of course, that makes it much, much easier because it's like really deeply built into the system. Um, and uh, here, by the way, we also built a connector to plug into TensorFlow Extended. So you can even, if you're using TensorFlow Extended, you can still leverage the UI and other uh, components out there. How, how to get started? Uh, there's a simple Docker image. Um, uh, you can simply run and then uh, there are a number of tutorials. We have a number of Jupyter notebooks out there uh, getting you started. If you have any uh, feature requests, any bug reports, there's an open source repo you can also contribute to. And uh, we also have a cloud service for you uh, where you can simply run it on, on a cloud service and you don't have to set up a database or anything uh, by yourself uh, to get started out there. Um, so uh, that's basically fully managed cloud solutions. There are certain uh, SLAs. Uh, you can either have temporary cloud instances for trying it out or also just exploring the idea, uh, or there are also production instances. So uh, thank you so much uh, for listening. I hope the kind of key points uh, I wanted to make here, if you're building a production ML system, keep in mind that uh, the for really operational value, 
uh, you should keep track of the provenance and actually the metadata of what's happening in your system. Having a great machine learning model by itself won't really buy you a lot of uh, value out there. If you can't reproducibly train it, if you can't explain like where the data is coming from uh, in, in most scenarios. So I would urge everyone to really try to build a, a pipeline and then keep track of the individual uh, items the flow between those different items in your machine learning pipeline. Um, we also have blog posts around that. Also, these slides include uh, various links uh, to, uh, to, for example, TensorFlow Extended, to MLD, uh, MD, and all other systems out there you might want to use for managing your machine learning metadata. I think that gives us still a few minutes for questions. Is that correct? Correct, Jörg. Thank you so much. Super talk from a superhero. So uh, I, oh, I'm not clear. Are you are you Batman or are you Deadpool? Which which uh, superhero are you? Uh, I, I feel like I'm more Robin helping the Batman yeah. <laughs> data scientist. To be even I, more I don't successful. believe that. I, I, I no. feel like more the sidekick out here. No, I don't think you're the sidekick at all. So yeah, you're right. We have a few minutes. You have a few minutes left. So um, let me pick up on something you said right at the beginning, which is that mm -hmm. you compared what data scientists are actually doing with what they should be doing. So mm -hmm. let me ask you, why aren't they doing what they should be doing? I don't think that came across uh, perhaps oh. as clearly as, as it could. I, I wouldn't necessarily say what they should should be doing. I think there's just a perception. If you talk to your favorite uh, CTO or to your favorite uh, management in some kind of company, there's often the impression they read like an article about, oh, deep learning is, is the greatest, best thing ever. Uh, so we, we need to do deep learning. So they'll get a team to uh, build a, a deep neural network model out there. And uh, I think there often the perception is uh, that they will just start out by building a cool model. And once this is there, kind of task solved and then move on to the next task. I think the, the challenge of actually operationalizing that model uh, is really undervalued. I wouldn't say that data scientists should be doing something else, but I would say the challenge of operationalizing your machine learning pipeline beyond uh, a research project is often underestimated. And that's also what I've seen across many different uh, verticals across many different companies as a main challenge for really adopting machine learning and gaining value out of it, uh, that you kind of focus on, oh, we have a cool model done, um, uh, kind of, and underestimates the effort which needs to be taken in into uh, building such model. So I think if, you take that into account, you can enable data scientists a bit more to focus on data model training, exploring data uh, by having really a team around that. So we saw on uh, one of the last slides, like kind of the different um, distinction of teams where you have like a data engineer who is actually in charge of that pipeline. So from my experience, most data scientists, they come from more a mathematical background. They really understand data and analyzing data uh, very well, uh, but they are not necessarily the operations people who will build this full-fledged uh, distributed system for model training, for inference, uh, and uh, of course, all of that should be fault tolerant. Okay, some uh, some viewers are asking if they're building their own platform, should they always include metadata in their ML pipeline, or are there certain cases where perhaps it's not so important? Uh, I would say um, if, if I'm building my own pipeline, I would at least keep in mind that this will become uh, crucial. So I would, I, I personally would say it's crucial for any pipeline uh, because you will want to look up this one model which is running in production and now all of a sudden is uh, throwing some errors like how was it trained? And imagine this is like someone being woken up at night, uh, 3 a.m. Uh, or on pager duty. Uh, you really want to have like all the information available, especially if it's someone new on that team or someone who hasn't built that initial model. And especially if you grow, uh, if you grow your team, it becomes more and more uh, important. If you have a simple like two-man team, uh, which is managing the entire pipeline, all of the training models, they probably will have most of that context, like they will have the metadata in their head most, most of the time. Um, so if, if it's 
some very small scenario or some research project where really this is not meant to be operationalized and it's probably not that important. But uh, my general recommendation would be keep it in mind for anything you build out there. All right, so there you have it. Anyone uh, wanting to know more, please get in contact directly with Jörg. We are unfortunately running a little bit tight on time, so all that remains for me is to say thank you very much for this fascinating talk, Jörg, and uh, we'll stay in touch. So thanks again. Thanks. Thanks, thanks a lot. Bye.